Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. I'm Matthew Feeney. And I'm Trevor Burrus. Joining us today is Brian Wilson. He's co-founder of Combat and Classics, a program out of St. John's that organizes free online seminars on classic texts for active duty, reserve, and veteran U.S. military. He's joining us today to discuss Plato's Apology. But Brian, let's maybe kick things off by having you tell us a bit about Combat and Classics. Sure. Uh, Combat and Classics is uh, sponsored by St. John's College. It's an outreach program through St. John's. Uh, I'm a graduate of the Graduate Institute in Annapolis. And uh, when I was kind of transitioning from student to alumnus, uh, approached the dean of the college and just said, you know, hey, what can I do for you guys? And they just really wanted to get kind of more involvement with the military. And uh, we thought the best way to do that was just by what we do at St. John's, which is just Socratic dialogue and great books, uh, just with a military audience. And is it coming over pretty well? Do you get? I mean, are there any texts that you tend to focus on mostly in that, or is it pretty broad? Is it classic philosophy or plays or so, Greek and Roman or anything? Yeah, like that? I mean, the the degree from St. John's right is liberal arts, and so we study everything from Euclid to Newton, to uh, Aristophanes, to Plato, to basically the the kind of classical liberal education. So we try to represent that as best we can with combat and classics. We do probably do a little bit more uh, history and philosophy, a little bit more Thucydides, a little bit more Herodotus, um, a little bit more Plato. Uh, but we try to get in um, a good amount of things that – you know, maybe somebody who's looking at the great books and is in the military has already started on. But, for instance, our um, our April and uh, our March and April seminars are both uh, Macbeth, so we'll be doing Shakespeare for those. But uh, our February upcoming uh, seminars on the Iliad. So we do, you know, kind of a martial theme to a certain extent, but it's uh, a broad swath of classical literature that we use. Well, then I guess let's turn to our our text we chose today. Plato's Apology, which is one that you've done seminars on. Yeah. Um, so give us some background on it. So the Apology is um, Socrates on trial, right? He has apparently corrupted the youth. Um, he is uh, accused of being a heretic, of not believing in the gods. And this is Socrates, you would call lackluster defense of, of those charges, um, but also a robust defense of what it means to uh, be an individual, to be able to stand up to the state uh, and what is the consequences of that for both the individual and the state. Why would you call the defense lackluster? I think that you – know, and Socrates I think admits this to a certain extent. He's um, – you know, Melitus, his accuser, has kind of made his case and Socrates is replying and, and uh, that's the beginning of the dialogue is Socrates' reply. And you know, he says like uh, what, what Melitus has said is – and the accusers at large is, is just not true, right? Uh, but it, it sways the, the jury, right? And it's obvious that it swayed the jury. And he says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to play this game. I'm just going to do what I do, which is seek truth, right? Examine virtue. And if you guys don't like that, all right, no big deal. And he's willing to accept the consequences of that decision of being kind of true to himself rather than, you know, I'm going to make a case to get myself out of punishment. Should we interpret this as um, – I've never gotten a good handle on on the theistic – I guess I'm trying to piety of the of the Greeks of how much are they kind of like modern day Christians who if you don't believe in their gods is always not with if you are uh, if you believe in, in many gods then you believe that you kind of accept other people who believe in those gods too and don't treat them as atheists as much so are we are these trumped up charges are we sort of like this impiety was it was it the worst thing in ancient Greece to believe in different gods than those god and this corruption of views are they are, should we interpret them as trumped up char charges no i think it's pretty clear that that they are trumped up um you know whether or not uh, socrates was a actual theist or an atheist or or what is is kind of one of those things that uh, and i know that Cato has talked about this in the past as far as like, you know, how much of a deist was Thomas Jefferson and George Washington? And so it's those kind of things where it's like, you know, only the people that 
uh, only only you know, you know how much you buy into whatever religious creed uh, you might or might not espouse. And so there were certain certainly questions that Socrates raised that could make people uncomfortable. Um, but there's no statement that I can think of in the entire kind of Platonic canon where he comes out and says, "I don't believe any of this stuff," right? But it's it's the questioning that um, certainly <laughs> causes. Um, Causes this accusation to to get carried forward and certainly swayed a decent amount of the jury. I think it's. I mean, it's pretty clear he's not. He's not a straight up atheist. Yeah. Like he very obviously he defends himself along these lines by saying, "Look, I talk all the time and tell people all the time about demigods, demigods, and demons and other things that assume the Does existence he mean like of Hercules? Gods. Is that what he is like? Hercules a demigod? Yeah. yeah. He, he talks about the demigods. He talks about the offspring of um, you know gods and men and. Um, I think you can. It, it's very much a, a Rorschach test. I think for the reader, right? If you want to read that as, if you're an atheist reader approaching the text, then you can go, "Oh, he's messing with these guys." But if you're a theist reader, then you can go, "No, he's trying to fit it into this uh, theist doctrine that's you know part of the community, and he's you know just trying to play by those rules." And well, may or may not believe them. I mean, it's certainly the case. Uh, I mean, at least towards the end, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but that he postulates um, after death there are a couple of possibilities and one is that it's just an eternal kind of sleep and the other is, hey, I've got to hang out with Homer and uh, yeah. all these other guys. <laughs> uh, but he, he seems and, – and so at the beginning there's this uh, question uh, when, when he, he speaks to the oracle and it seems like hard to believe uh, someone not taking that seriously with, um, without some sort of theistic belief. If you really don't believe that the oracle was the voice of, um, of a god, then – his uh, walking around Athens trying to see if he could find someone wiser than him seems a little pointless. Uh, one final question I want to uh, ask before – we may open up a bag of worms here. But before we get fully into the text is, is this a history? I mean your guess is as good as mine on that. I think that um, you know, I, I always liked uh, Christopher Hitchens' kind of description of um, – Socrates versus Jesus. You know, it's like it's not important if if you're looking at Socrates whether or not he existed at all, right? You you can you can take his teachings and you can take whatever you want out of that, right? And it's not important if he existed or didn't exist or if this is what he said or didn't say. You know? But it's a little so, different because because in this one, I think one of two maybe of Plato's dialogues. Plato is supposed to be there, mm -hmm. so maybe he was taking notes. So that it kind of brings that specter a little but I bit think, more. But I think this is complicated by so we only we only have two accounts of Socrates' defense. Mm -hmm. We have Plato's and, and then we have now, right. Xenophon, yeah, Xenophon, Xenophon, who is yeah. another follower of Socrates. Um, but then at the same time, there's this at after Socrates' death, it was kind of a thing for writers to write their own versions of his defense. It was like just fan fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and Which is so, also probably kind of like a Rorschach test. They all wrote it in the way that they saw yes. Socrates. Yes. And so it's I mean it's, so it's a little bit difficult. Like we have we have almost no texts. What we do know about Socrates largely comes from Plato and Xenophon. And Plato very clearly drifts away from Socrates presenting Anything that even is remotely, you know, historical or documentary um, in his later dialogues, where we get to just these are Plato's ideas and Socrates is a mouthpiece for them. There's the argument made that I think seems relatively persuasive to me that of the two apologies that we have, Plato's and Xenophon's, like Xenophon, well, a smart guy, was not a genius on the level of Plato, um, and so. It's it's less so. Plato's genius probably takes over a bit more in his presentation, um, but they're I mean they're similar enough. Although it's the Xenophon Socrates is not his speech is not the great work of literature that we read for today, um, and is is quite a bit more straightforward. But the skeleton is relatively the same, so we could probably say, I mean, there's some level of accuracy there, but we don't know. Um, so I think I think largely when we're talking about Socrates, we're analyzing Socrates in the way that we would talk about Hamlet, right? Like we we act as if we analyze him as a real person while recognizing too that he was a historical figure. But what we're really talking about is Plato's presentation of him. So, so let's talk about that skeleton. Then, uh, how does the dialogue open up? Well, the dialogue. I mean, it, it rolls right into the defense, right? And there, there's no, <laughs> which I find always find interesting, is that there's not really a presentation of uh, the accuser's argument. You know, it is it is just the defense, 
and you have to kind of start with that question. I mean, there is a dialogue that's supposed to have happened right before the trial, which is the youth youth fro, um, which I know I'm pronouncing wrong because my Greek is pretty terrible. Um, but he, they don't really talk much about Socrates' trial, right? They talk about uh, Euthyphro's uh, trial for um, for um, manslaughter. So we we open with this, and Socrates immediately <laughs> kind of goes for underwhelming. You know, he says, "I do not know what effect my accusers have had upon you." He's speaking to the jury. But for my own part, I was almost carried away by them. Their arguments were so convincing. On the other hand, scarcely a word of what they said was true. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful line to read during a presidential election. Yeah. Uh, Should and, we be picturing him in a, uh, an amphitheater type situation with like in a, I picture this as a circle with the people sitting on benches around him while speaking to them. Is that a? I always kind of think about it as like Perry Mason. That's that's. Oh, what okay. I'm it was uh, yeah. the, these kind of juries. I think were done. Um, I forget the name of the location, but it's, it's quite close to the Acropolis, and it would have been about for the time about five hundred people would have yeah. been hearing uh, the accusation and the defense. Uh, on the top of this rather small hill in Athens. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the uh, police procedural has just kind of uh, tainted my visualization a little <laughs> bit too much. So I just, I'm visualizing law and order. Mm -hmm. and, and the setup, just the setup of this trial and the way it functions, is I think something we could talk about because it's fairly interesting as a contrast to the way that we do things now. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, he's he, he has this jury of 500 people, right? Um, and it, it seems obvious to me that they've been fairly swayed by the accusers. Um, what we usually do at St. John's uh, when we're when we're opening um, a seminar, when we're talking about something like this, is that the the tutor will just ask an opening question, mm -hmm. and from there, um, there's not really. We're, we're trying to stick to the reading as much as possible. Obviously, you're the hosts and you're the Cato Institute, so if we want to talk about the Iowa caucus, then. Go for it, but <laughs> please no, um, probably, not. <laughs> probably not. But we we just try to stick to the text um, as much as we can for our points uh, and for our questions. So the question I would like to ask you is: What is Socrates' mindset during this trial? So I, I think that's a, a great opening because if you think about the timeline here, he's already an old man, um, 70. seventy, which uh, you know is. Be considered pretty old now, let alone in uh, ancient Greece. And reading the defense, I got the impression that he might be just sort of resigned to the way this might end um, and the way it will end because uh, he's an old man uh, and he, the way he's addressing it, he, he discusses how death isn't particularly that bad and the important thing is to lead a good life and that uh, you shouldn't calculate the chances of living or dying. You should think about doing the right thing versus the wrong thing and maybe if I die, I'll be able to um, – an eternal sleep or talk to people I admire and I can continue these conversations. So part of me thinks um, his mindset might be, well, I could be doomed but at least I can go out in a great rhetorical flourish and make these people look a little silly. And I think he, he succeeds in doing that, especially with uh, Melitus, that, that accuser. Well, I, I could – yeah, I kind of agree with Matthew. I, I think also that – I always read Socrates as so tongue-in-cheek, uh, the way he spoke to people um, that I kind of – I kind of read the apology as him being kind of angry uh, and his righteousness against the accusing apparatus. And this is why I think it is a libertarian-ish te text or something we can learn, just political philosophy about a person standing against a, a power who has the righteous position, uh, which he discusses later on. And if you do think you have the righteous position, and if, I mean, that's the way Socrates is, does everything. Uh, do you think he would never say it? He'd be like, you know, he's like, what do you think, Socrates? Do you have the righteous position? He's like, I don't know, sir. Do you think I have the righteous position? Are cows righteous? He would never say it, but you know, he does think this. Um, mm -hmm. And now he's going to stand in front of the the, the polis, which is a much more um, community oriented type of concept than the current state. But and then tell them. Basically, like a pox on your house, on both your houses, or all, all of you, and that's so. I, I see anger. In it. Yeah, that was my reading more so than just resignation. Was the righteousness coming in because he's so he tells us this story of the Oracle of Delphi saying that he's the wisest man alive, and that he's basically built a career around trying to assess that because he like he doesn't think of himself as wise, um, but. 
which of course I think he really does, but he just likes to think he's not. Um, and it's because he recognizes his lack of wisdom that the oracle thinks he's the most wise. But to kind of test this, he goes around asking people who are presumed to be wise and testing their wisdom and always finding it lacking. Um, and so he – and he's got this other part where he goes in about the training of the horses, right, where he says, um, you know, you wouldn't – when you, when you want to break a horse, you call in an expert. You don't just have like everyone break the horse because that's not going to work and that seems to be a dig against this system. And so I read this as like a – like look, I've been going around showing all of you up and now you've done this dumb thing where you're putting me on trial and so it's not just that I'm kind of resigned to my fate and I don't really think that living over 70 would be all that awesome anyway and death isn't all – isn't something to worry about but also that – you know, I'm going to prove – like my last, last act will be proving that I was right all along by getting – by showing the complete lack of wisdom of all of you and that seems to be – because he's constantly provoking them. This isn't just like a lackluster defense. This is like come and get me, right? And so even when he's given like every opportunity and we get that in the, the follow-up dialogue, the credo where he's given the opportunity after he's been convicted to run away and he just doesn't take it like at every step. He seems to want them to kill him, you know. Even when I mean they, they've declared him guilty, and he offers up these basically absurd alternative sentences that he knows they're going to reject. Um, he just he seems angry, and he seems like he wants to demonstrate the foolishness of the people of Athens. Yeah, I mean, he. he I, I like the idea of anger, just because you know, right at twenty eight, um, he kind of has a external, internal dialogue and says, but perhaps someone will say, do you feel no compunction, Socrates, in having followed a line of action which puts you in danger of the death penalty? I might fairly reply to him, you are mistaken, my friend, if you think that a man who is worth anything ought to spend his time weighing up the prospects of life and death. And he gives the example of Achilles, right, which we have this you know, whole book of Homer about and the first word of that is menace, right? Rage and it's sing them use of the rage of Achilles. And so, he, you know, he kind of brings it off and, and, and the whole presentation, I mean, you can obviously, if you're directing this, you can, you know, get a Mickey Rourke in there or you can, you know, kind of get somebody a little bit more relaxed. But, you know, the, the, the rage is there, right? I mean, it, it, it's right in the dialogue when he brings up Achilles. But what's, what's interesting to me is that, you know, he, he says right there, um, you know the the idea of even questioning that, right? The idea of you know thinking about that is, but that's what Achilles did for you know, half the book, and so I feel like there's kind of a uh, maybe a duality there of he's saying it's wrong, but he might also be implying that there's a certain bit of human nature in wanting to spare yourself. Do do any of you feel like Socrates tries at any point to kind of at least give himself some breathing room in the dialogue to maybe? You know, convince the jury I'm not as big a threat as you think I am. Uh, I mean, I, I think that he certainly does um, make fools of the accusers and make the make the charges sound ridiculous. But I think, as uh, as Aaron alluded to earlier, after the vote where he's found guilty, uh, but not by a particularly large margin, and Socrates as well. I'm glad that you didn't. Uh, you know, that I, I got some support here, but then goes on to propose that they give him a pension or that they uh, you know that some you know comparatively meager fine be imposed and he seems to he must have known that that would lose him what what support he probably did have uh, and and then you know instead of uh, a sort of sensible negotiation or proposal he's sentenced to death and I think that uh, that that's quite telling well I think that the interesting he does try to some extent but this at the beginning he mentions Aristophanes the cloud. Uh, the clouds, which kind of parodies Socrates, but it, it, he seems like a guy who um, believes that popular opinion is of one thing about him. Uh, like, if, if you imagine a star today, and everyone thinks that, that like there's some sort of rumor about someone, and that there's really nothing he can do to change this, uh, especially because I do think that he believes that most people are stupid, uh, and so. He says, well, I get up there and I talk to a bunch of stupid people who have uh, 
an idea about me because of this opinion that's in the clouds and other sort of just rumors about me and I'm not going to convince them at all. But I think he does try or at least tries to make a case with a few people who might be willing to listen to him to some degree. Trevor Burrus Well, that was – I mean teasing out this whether – like because he defends himself but whether it's an attempt to soften it as you asked or just to not – I guess give in to what he sees as false charges because he you know he could have just said okay you're right and then throw himself on the mercy of the court um or not really mounted much of a defense if he didn't care one way or another um or but he but it seems like his defense is I guess why I had a difficult time figuring out is how much of the defense was like him trying to like I don't want to be punished and so I'm going to try to defend myself versus I totally don't care what happens to me and in fact would like to be punished because it would prove me right. But I can't stand by – and because he, he talks about how much what ultimately matters is not wealth. It's not prestige. It's the kind of person you are. It's your principles. Um, and so he's not going to – he's going to defend his honor and his principles against these false charges. But it doesn't matter what happens to him ultimately. Can we compare this to? I mean, it has been, of course, but can we compare this to Jesus in front of Pontius Pilate, in the sense of Jesus offering a defense against a crowd with a huge bias against him and saying nothing in response to their claims of of his his own type of of disobedience of of the uh, Pharisees? I think it's very similar. Except for Jesus was a little bit more taciturn. Yeah, so I haven't actually uh, heard much about that comparison, but I think what they both have in common is that that to a contemporary twenty first century reader in Washington D.C., it's very, the thing that Socrates and Jesus do seem to have in common is that they're being accused of what's effectively thought crime. In the sense, like you have the wrong kind of ideas, and uh, you're you're being you're being you're being too persuasive to people <laughs> and all this other sort of stuff. But in our um, in our post rationalization because they kind of both start movements or these are, these texts are at least written for the purpose of starting a movement. Um, and both of these are just like, well, I'm going to die and my death is going to be a lesson. I mean it's a, it's a really big lesson for Jesus but, but uh, it's, they, they just sort of resign themselves to the fate and so we see a trial which again has a righteousness of standing against the power uh, that, that is arrayed against you. Yeah, and it is uh, the case that Socrates does say, I think at the end, something like, look, you're going to Think yourself a little silly, um, and I think he's been proven right. Well, there's a Pharisaic quality to the people who are accusing him. I mean, uh, and, and, and that's what I, these, these three accusers, who I think are just some sort of, they represent classes. Yeah. If, I, if I read that correctly. Yeah. I, I mean, well, I, I, the the way that I kind of tie this in more is I feel like that Plato. I mean obviously this is an important part of the canon, right, of the Platonic canon, an important part of Socrates. I don't know if you need it, you know? Like you you need the Pontius Pilate story to have a, you know, serious impact on Christianity. I don't know if you need the apology to make um, you know, Socrates understood. But it is important, but I I would compare it more to something like Kafka's The Trial, um, you know, something like Orwell, something like you know Eileen Chang's Naked Earth, where it's you're you're against this, you're against the state, right? And that and, and Socrates lays it out, right? He says very specifically uh, around 31C. Um, he, he basically says, he says, you know, I don't mess with the state because I know what's going to happen, right? The last part of um, 31C, the true champion of justice, if he intends to survive even for a short time, must necessarily confine himself to private life and leave politics alone, right? So and, – and he's tried to go out of his way to do this, but the state doesn't care, right? The state just by questioning any aspect of its doctrine is going to get insulted, right? Um, I like how he keeps bringing up how he makes no money. It kind of there's a lot of things that in I'm a, as a lawyer, there's a lot of things in the world where the state can't get you until you're making money off of it. <laughs> they don't have they don't have any jurisdiction over you until you're making money off of it. So he's like, hey, I'm just doing this, you know, my own private life. Private's private. You yeah. Know? Well, and, and the thing is that this is the only thing that the only two things that they could threaten, right, was first saying you can't do this anymore, right? 
um, and it was important for him to be able to do it and in Athens. And then the only other thing was his life, right? And so if he if he wants to take that kind of binary look and say, you know, if this or that, it does show how necessary he sees exploring, you know, what is the virtuous life as a, at least critical for him. And I think that you know that example obviously shines through uh, in a very robust way in what he's talking about. Uh, you know, something that we talk about because uh, we've done this seminar um, a couple times with the military audience is uh, right around line 29. Um, and he says, the truth of the matter is this, gentlemen, and this is right after the Achilles comparison. The truth of the matter is this, gentlemen, where a man has once taken up his stand either because it seems best to him or in obedience to his orders, there I believe he is bound to remain and face the danger, taking no account of death or anything else before dishonor. This being so, it would be shocking. It would be a shocking inconsistency on my part, gentlemen, if when the officers whom you chose to command me assigned me my position at Potidaea and Amphopolis and in Delium, I remained at my post like anyone else and faced death. And yet afterwards, when God appointed me, as I supposed and believed the duty of leading the philosophic life, examining myself and others, I were then through fear of death or any other danger to desert my post. And so, well, that's like super fiery uppy for like libertarians. Um, you know, you have to wonder how effective that is. You know, how effective is that analogy to you as readers? How effective potentially is that for a military reader? Um, I mean, it certainly puts I think a lot of military readers kind of on the horns of a dilemma. Is you know there is this idea of death before dishonor? Um, you know what? Why is Socrates so set on you know either not teaching philosophy um, as more dishonorable than death? Well, I, I think it might strike us as. Um Maybe a little odd as readers now uh, to to hear that rhetoric, especially coming from someone who was a philosopher. But uh, I think it's important to remember that that Socrates was a soldier for a while, uh, and that one of the accusers uh, is a general who fought the the Spartans in the Peloponnesian War, and that a lot of people in Athens at the time would have understood the role of the military and would probably have served. Uh, and I think it's some sort of appeal. And of course, saying. I'm just like Achilles is, is a clear. You know, everyone um, in ancient Greece would have known. The reference clearly and um, Homeric uh, legends were very popular. Uh, and of course, Achilles had this living with dishonor is worse than death and that even if I know I'm dead after I fight uh, and kill Hector, that's that's worthwhile. Uh, and he, he seems to view his own death uh, – I mean I think the, the Socrates' arrogance is uh, on display in a number of places. But my, my favorite example of that was when he says – Maybe if I die, I can um, – uh, my death will be like other people who died unjustly. And he cites uh, Palamedes who was of course sent to get Odysseus, the great trickster, to come to Troy. Uh, and Palamedes tricked the trickster because Odysseus tried to uh, pretend to be insane, was sowing salt into the earth. And Palamedes put Odysseus' son Telemachus in front of the plow and tricked Odysseus because Odysseus wasn't going to cut his own uh, son in half of the plow. And I just find that uh, – a really interesting compare that when he says my death will be like other unjust deaths and that it's deaths of um, at least one particularly clever person uh, is really quite telling. But no, I, I think going back to the original line of inquiry here that the, the military rhetoric is very deliberate and I think he must have known that it would have um, pulled on the heartstrings of a few of the people on the jury. Well, a lot of the this tradition of death before dishonor or um, anyone from – Gandhi to Martin Luther King to all people standing against and saying, "I will not, you know, I will not forsake my principles for this this thing that's standing against me that has none of these principles at all." Uh, it resonates with almost everyone. I mean, movies, everything is made after this, and, and you can always sort of put a libertarian uh, spin on this. But I think it's interesting that this is something I hadn't noticed before uh, that. And I don't have the exact locations, unfortunately, that, that you do for the official version. But he's done this before. Socrates talks about the 30 
and like how he had done this before. He had stood against this this the thirty. The uh, but when the oligarchy of the thirty was in power, they sent me and four others into the rotunda and bade us bring Leon the Salaminian from Salamis, as they wanted to put him to death. This was a specimen of the sort of commands which they were always giving, with a view of implicating as many as possible in their crimes. So we get this their basically some sort of Stalinist despotism, just killing people left and right. And then I showed not in, not in word only but in deed that if I may be allowed to use such an expression, I cared not a straw for death and that my great and only care was lest I should do an unrighteous or unholy thing. For the strong arm of that oppressive power did not frighten me into doing wrong. And when we came out of the rotunda, the other four went to Salamis and fetched Leon, but I went quietly home, for which I might have lost my life had not the power of the thirty shortly afterwards come to an end. And, and many will witness my words. So it was, it's kind of interesting that at some point, and I'm not sure historically how long ago that was, he had, he had made a habit of this death before unrighteousness kind of thing. Yeah, the the historical context here is is interesting because uh, this sort of this oligarchy, this pro Spartan uh, set of tyrants, uh, were. In charge, effectively, in charge of Athens. And do you know uh, what years? So which? this was 404. So just five years before. Five, yeah, yeah, it was very, very recent. It was very recent, and and I think the um, apologies to the historians if that's wrong, uh, but it was it was recent, uh, and I think there there are certainly people who claim that part of the uh, accusation against Socrates was that he stuck around in Athens and certainly knew um, the leader of these tyrants and was and that was not perceived as uh, particularly. Was actually, good. I mean, he was a, he was like a mentor of. Of, uh, of Critias, Critias who is right, the leader yeah. of the tyrants. I mean, so that's so he's like a Vichy. So to like some a, extent, like, a, like because we reading this um, thousands of years later, we look. You know, this looks very bad for the people of Athens, right? But I think that we can we can defend them a bit um, in the sense that you know this the historical situation you had. Athens' democracy, it was taken over by these tyrants. Things were very bad. Socrates had been the mentor of the leader of the tyrants. Um, he had also been the friend and mentor of Alcibiades who had worked against the democracy, had been kicked out, had run off to Sparta, was pro-Spartan. Um, Socrates is at least presented by Plato, seems to like a lot of elements of the Spartan regime. Um, he didn't leave when the thirty took over, uh, and and so and then my understanding is when the thirty left, there was a treaty that was signed that granted some degree of amnesty to people who were involved in it. And so, if the people of Athens were mad at him for what looked like support of the of the thirty, um, and then there was this also notion in Greece at the time that like the mentor was to some degree always responsible for the actions of his students because it was his job to teach them and they were carrying out his teachings um, and so they could blame Socrates for what happened. But the treaty prevents them from trying him for that and so this is possibly a run around the, the treaty. You know, so it doesn't look – so we can, still, we can still judge them harshly but there may have been – complicating factors here, which is why these charges look so silly. Um, it's kind of like the Kafka essay that Brian yeah, mentioned. So, so if we can you – know, this is all good background. I don't mean to turn us off on this. But within the text and taking into account those kind of historical precedents, why did Socrates stick around through all this, through the tyrants, through Alcibiades' defection? And through this trial, he has no property, right? I mean, that's what ties us to to the state in a lot of ways, right? We usually have property, and it's hard to move it. Um, why did he stick around? Right, righteousness again. I'm going to say, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think uh, you know, he, he's an old man. He might just not be up for you know this political uncertainty and go, going into uh, you know, fleeing Athens. Uh, although, yeah, you know, whatever his reasons, I think it would be. Mistaken to think that he was some sort of supporter of the, this oligarchy, that, that he was pro this tyranny. Uh, and I, I think it would be a little unfair. Trump. But he does seem anti democracy. Sure, but, the, but the, these, are, these can be mutually exclusive, right? You can be anti democracy and also anti the tyranny at the time. Um, so, yeah, that's a good, I think, uh, historical question. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if anyone knows. I mean, he gives uh, reasons. But, this is 
on the next text, so I won't. But he, I mean, he does give some reasons for sticking around in the credo, which is when his followers show up while he's in jail waiting execution and say, "Look, we can get you out of here. It'll be easy. We just bribe the guards. Kind of everyone's expecting you to do it." Like El Chapo, leave. yeah. Um, and yes, and. <laughs> Um, and he says no and he presents these reasons and every intern semester I give a talk to the interns about the credo and about obligations to obey the law and say that Socrates' arguments are all terrible. Um, but but he does he does have these arguments. But my sense, I mean, from this and from just what we know of him as his character is I mean, Athens is his home. Um he like he seems to be Socrates seems like a creature of habit. I mean to the degree that I think one of the more delightful parts of this text is at the end when he's talking about – so Socrates is – he would be a hard guy to live around. I mean he just goes around harassing people. <laughs> like, he would be horrible next he's, door neighbor. He's a pain in the ass. He'd be like a Jehovah's Witness next door neighbor like, that just yeah. never stopped knocking but on he's your like, door. He's a historically <laughs> epic pain in the ass. Yeah. And, and then he doesn't – when he's talking about death at the end and he's like, death is nothing to fear because on the one hand, it might be oblivion, which he like then says, really is like, like, which is a really good night's sleep. <laughs> um, or there's an afterlife and in the afterlife, I can go and harass all of those people too. <laughs> you know, and you can imagine all of these like great Greek heroes looking down from the afterlife and just saying, please don't kill him. Please don't kill him. Um, but he just seems to be like – he just knows this way of life. This is what he does and that's my reading of to a large extent why he doesn't leave. There's the principal reason, like he doesn't think he should have to, but he just this is this is what he knows. This is his home. This is what he's been doing for years. Your comment about being anti democracy, but before the passage I read about the thirty, he seems to call that the days of the democracy. And again, I don't know how much he supports it, but he says that right before the part I led, when I made up my mind that I'd run the risk having law and justice with me rather than take part in your injustice because I feared imprisonment and death. This happened in the days of the democracy, but when the oligarchy of the thirty, da 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 da. So that's is he is that does that sound to you also like he's saying that that was the same time as the thirty, the democracy? That that, that was unclear to me, but I, he is pretty anti-democratic. I think that's that's quite yeah. clear. I wanted to the this question of. The orders and what sort of orders he used to obey and the death before dishonor. I want to tease that out a bit from this libertarian perspective because it is – I mean it's a really – it's a fairly radical notion, right? And especially in the context of military people um, that you know that there are there are principles that he thinks were knowable via philosophy, principles of honor, principles of justice, and that those trump that those trump the state. Um, that they, you know, that the orders of the king, the orders of the democracy, are not synonymous with justice, and that when they conflict with justice, when they conflict with basic morality, our duty is to this these higher principles. It's not to the state, um, which is, I mean, important from a libertarian perspective because many of our arguments, libertarianism, when argued from a moral background instead of in, – as opposed to say just like a economic efficiency arguments is often like, look, what the state does is morally wrong. It's morally wrong to take people's money in these ways. It's morally wrong to lock them in cages for taking certain substances and that it's your duty to follow morality and not the dictates of the state. But this is – I mean Trevor, you said everyone kind of believes the death before dishonor. Um, to some degree, but it's also it's an extremely controversial Schmitt, thing. Maybe. I mean, I you know, like, does this mean that? I think it's true that this means that, say, like a district attorney has a moral obligation not to prosecute people for unjust under unjust laws, and that in fact, if they do, they are behaving immorally and should be condemned for it. But you could take it to the extreme in the military. I remember there was a Twitter trending topic a while back of like express your unpopular opinion, and. Um, I think it was Will Wilkinson who used to be at Cato and now is not. His thing was soldiers who kill in unjust wars are murderers, which is an extremely controversial and radical claim to make and certainly is not something that like you would have higher ups in the military saying is the case, right? Yeah, I think there's a lot more gray area than you might think. Okay. I mean something that's kind of shocking to folks that haven't spent a lot of time um, – you know, with military folks who have been in the military themselves, and you know, it's something that I was kind of surprised at. You know, I went through the Naval Academy um, and then spent 13 years in the Marine Corps, and you know, there 
there's almost a dual pronged education system there. There is you would be shocked at the amount of time that we spent in situations like this sitting around and talking about what's the right thing to do, you know? And how much it is reinforced that, you know, you have to make unpopular decisions, you have to make decisions that are contrary to what somebody told you to do because it's the right thing. And for a lot of folks, they just look at me after I say something like that and they're like, no, that's not how it is. <laughs> and I go, I go, I'm pretty sure it is. I was, I was there. Um, and you know that that helps you a great deal, I think, in your kind of own you know personal moral education. Uh, and the the troubling thing that you find is that you find people that in the military that ignore that. You know, they've had that training, but they err on the side of. Um, you know, not examining that maybe as closely as you'd like them to, but you know, I'm 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 consistently um, kind of gratified by the number of folks that um, seem completely at ease, more or less. With I know if I'm told something to do and it's wrong, that I'm not going to do it, and I'll accept the consequences of that. And it, it's 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 fascinating. And you know, the the kind of trite piece of that is you know. Uh, you make an oath to the Constitution and not, you know, to the orders of your higher ups, right? Um, and the key thing there is that you just have to accept the consequences, right? So no matter what what it is that you're choosing to do or not do, you have to accept the consequences. And you know, the example that that I always like to give is, um, you know, Omar from The Wire, where it's, you know, man's got to have a code, right? And a lot of people in the military kind of understand that going in, and you know, there's really, from my experience. A, a fairly small minority that don't get that, that don't you know understand that. And the way that I would describe it, you know, having been to Iraq, um, is that you know I, I suited up for game time today. You know, I got I got my, I got my uniform on. Like I'm I'm here to play. Right. If somebody else wants to suit up and get on the field with me, that's that's fine. They are they're in the game. But if they're not on the field, they are spectators. You know, they they should not. Have anything happen to them at all, to them or their property or you know their family or anything? They are not in the game, and that is something that is you know reinforced. I would say a significant amount in uh, in the military, and it's you know it's it's clear in our rules of engagement to a certain extent. There's ambiguity there. Um, there's certainly folks that buck against that, but. Um, you know, with with my experience in kind of the counterinsurgency realm, it's it's how you I won't say win, uh, but it's how you don't lose. So how do, how do the military the, in, in your program, Combat Classics, like uh, you probably talk about this in regards mm -hmm. to apology? In yeah. Terms of, like, could is this something we can learn lessons from? In our jobs as military, about what what happens when you're in a Nuremberg type situation or something like this, where you, yeah, you have I mean, to. I, I really like you know the people that that show up for these um, are already kind of questioning a lot of things and they're already wondering, you know, what else is out there as far as education. I mean, you know, another reason that you know I started this program was because I was enrolled in um, Command and Staff College. Uh, which is you know a requisite for field grade officers in the Marine Corps, and I did that after St. John's, and I just did not have a very good time. You know, it was <laughs> it was it was not something that was edifying and enlightening. You know, when when I'm you know in Annapolis or, or in these online seminars, there are these you know moments of tremendous joy in in reading these kind of limitless works and you know just talking with other people and you know having them help me learn in the socratic fashion you know what what these what this means you know is it logical does it make sense and does it represent you know human nature and if 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 not where are the flaws and picking those things apart is something i think that a lot of military audience want to do to a greater degree because too often it is um you know, it, it it is a Nuremberg example. You know, it is it is a, it is you know Lieutenant Callie and Milai. It, it, those are the examples that that are drawn out. And so, I think that the the our type of audience wants something like you know Socrates' Apology, 
where it's like it's not you know it's not 100% clear because you know it, was the state right in doing this is another question you know do they have the power to do this is it within their purview to do something like this was socrates a threat to the state and does the state have a moral obligation to act against those kind of threats and you know, well, I'd love any of your feedback on any of those questions because that's what I do. Well, I, uh, that was that was part of my question too, uh, and I thought you guys would have more these uh, accusers because I wanted to try and get a grip on what the state is in in this because it, it is not totally analogous to what we would call you know post Weberian, you know, post Westphalian Weberian definition of a state. But these accusers, if they're real, if they were even real people, which is a, a, probably a silly question, but they seem to just represent classes of Athenian society, and he calls all of them idiots. Basically, I mean, as, as Aaron mentioned, like Socrates went around and was trying to figure out if anyone was wise, and he said all these people are really smart, but they're all not wise at all. Well, uh, that I just that I, so they're just standing here. There's a wonderful. I love this line. Um, where he's talking about his attempt to go and find people who are wise and he talks about looking at artists and poets and he says poets are by far the worst because <laughs> they think that they are wise but they totally aren't, which is interesting in light of how much he and everyone else cites Homer and other poets as authorities. But he says um, – he's talking about why they might overestimate their wisdom and so he says because he, someone who is say a very good poet or a very good artist, because he excelled in the practice of his art. He thought he was very wise in other most important matters and this mistake of theirs obscured the wisdom that they really possessed. And I just – that explains so much of human behavior and political opinions and Washington and – that's why there's no topic under the sun that Paul Krugman won't write about. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. Or Aaron's big thing about people who have some knowledge of tech, therefore have large knowledge of how to reorganize healthcare. Yeah. Or, or I went to a I went to a dinner with um, a Nobel laureate who had uh, in economics and had done work on a fairly narrow field in economics, and then received his Nobel Prize, and then wrote a book about basically the decline of. America and American culture and it was everything that's wrong with basically the kids these days. Um, and it was very clear after listening to him talk that his real problem was he just didn't understand what the internet was <laughs> and and like didn't – he didn't understand what – like he had his tastes and he liked classical music and so rock and roll was a decline and he liked Baroque art and so graffiti artists were an example of the end of Western civilization. And so it was this like he, – he thought, you know, I've been awarded this – the this prize, there's no prize that says you are wise more than the Nobel Prize, right? <laughs> and but it was for this narrow thing, and he was very good in that line of his art. But he thought that represented wisdom everywhere else, and this seems to be a very cut. Paul Krugman being another Nobel laureate who thinks he knows everything about everything. So I, I would, I, I mean, on that, going off that, um, with these critics who represent these different classes of Athenian society. Or at least that's the way I read it, who are all called idiots uh, by Socrates and I would say by Plato. And it, it, I mean, at this point in Athenian society, it's a kind of a democracy. And so there's also there's a huge condemnation of the way that society and the state is currently made up and the kind of idiots who run it, which again, I have to go back to it, but again, it was very similar to Jesus in the trial because a huge part of the gospel writer's intention was to lambast the Jews. Who you know, quote unquote, killed Jesus and the Pharisees and the Sadducees? These different groups that were just bad, and so like there's a subtext there in the in in the uh, Gospels. And here we see we can read Plato's condemnation of everything about, it. and then we know from the Republic what he really thinks a a good society looks like, and it's not very similar to what the one that killed Socrates. Yeah, I mean, I think that for me this, and it might be self congratulatory, right? But you know, as libertarians, we say, I don't know how to live your life. You know, I don't know what you should do with your property. I just know that you shouldn't hurt me, uh, and you probably shouldn't hurt other people too. You know, but a lot of that's none of my business. So, you know, we want to pat ourselves on the back and say, to a certain extent, like, you know, we've we've accomplished some kind of Socratic ideal. I don't know how well we hew to that too much because I think that our instincts are like, you know, most humans' instincts of wanting to get involved in things that we potentially shouldn't. Um, but you know, I, I 
I, and I, it also causes me having you know because we, we we think we kind of figured it out right we think we got oh it's property right it's property it's it's, it's libertarian yeah it's yeah. it's it's you know voluntary interaction it's um, you know we've we've got these principles and so I think it actually while we can pat ourselves on the back to a certain degree and say you know we have the Socratic ideal of I don't know what's best for you there's still a long way to go in maybe I'm not sure that this is actually right. You know, when we you know read kind of the foundational authors, if we're reading Mises or, Hay- Mises or Hayek or something like that, even in you know technical economic terms, we go, I don't know if this is right. You know, and so I think that you know from the libertarian audience, they can get a ton from these kind of seminars, from these kind of readings, uh, and the military audience as well, because the military audience I think is also fairly sure how certain things are, but when you tr- when you actually peel away those layers and you say, well, define your terms. You know, and Socrates doesn't really do that either. You know, but I think that that's probably, at least for me, that's kind of how I found libertarianism is because you know I thought I was part of Team Red. You know, because that's basically what it is: Team Red, Team Blue. And I thought I was part of Team Red, and I was like, okay, let me read about this conservative Republican stuff. And I went, oh, this doesn't make any sense. (laughs) (laughs) And and you know, you have to dig through those principles, and you have to question and question and question. And when you think you've figured out the right answer. You're you're probably a militus, and you're probably wrong. Yeah, I, I think uh, what, what I especially like about the text, uh, and, and what you just said, reminded me of it is that uh, what Socrates does is he's asking his accusers to answer questions truthfully, and they do, and they look dumb. Is this <laughs> sort of amazing? Uh, and I think that that's why these are, are such profound texts that you read these accusers uh, digging themselves into these logical holes, and Socrates is left with. The truth on his side. So I'm you, imagining like uh, going to a White House press conference and being like, "You must answer truthfully now," <laughs> right, yeah. making them look like idiots. Right, but you can. It's sort of a great image to think of these these hundreds of people staring down on on Socrates, asking, "You know, I just want you to, you know, just lay it out for people to hear <laughs> exactly what you think I've done and why you don't like my response." And I think uh, the power of that. Is, I mean, I, I think it's the reason why it, it remains so poignant. Is that uh, it's not some sort of uh, uh, crime novel where there have been trumped up evidence or whatever. It's these people really believe that what Socrates has ad- admits that he's doing is wrong, and thing and uh, that that's uh, that's what I think makes it really great reading. And I think that's what it. Your point about even these principles that we as libertarians believe are correct and hold to very strongly, we should have this degree of. Why and might I be wrong and might I change my mind, which is a point that we make a lot on free thoughts, um, makes this this notion – I mean Socrates when he presents like this is – look, the choice is between you know, sticking to justice or doing what I'm told and we want to we want to read the apology as look, he's – Socrates is standing up for justice in principle as opposed to the Athenians who are just angry at him or want to kill him off. But but these are arguments about principle that's going on here. I mean the Athenians think that they have principle on their side, that there is such a thing as impiety and he has been impious and being pious is really important at a basic principle level and that democracy matters and that respecting your elders matters and that teaching the youth to disrespect their elders or doubt the wise is harmful to society and that these are important principles. And so they disagree with Socrates on – the core principles of what really matters and that that's what the argument is about um, and that that's a very important thing for libertarians to think about, for everyone to think about, that you're, you're closely – that when there's political disagreement, say, that it's often at the level of – it can happen at the level of principle. That it's not that you are principled and your opponents aren't, right? It's that they hold different views and they may be wrong but – before we condemn them, we should make an attempt to really dig into them, to really understand them, to really learn from them. And that's a tricky thing, and that's part of the reason why you know, I wanted to ask about the mindset. You know, because it's it's always staggering for me to you know read any Plato and not, and not put myself in Socrates' situation and just you know say I just want to punch this guy. You know, like it, it's it's so it's just seems so demanding to 
both, you know, having done it, I'm sure we've all done something, tried to do some type of Socratic dialogue. And whether you're talking with, you know, another libertarian who's just like a little bit off from what you think is more important, or whether you're talking to a socialist or a Republican or a Democrat, and you know, you feel that that anger begin to swell at some point. You know, I don't it, either anger or just. You know, you start laughing inside at least. You mean that they're and, not giving the right answers. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're not being truthful. Yeah. You know, they're not they're not they're not examining. And so it, you know, it, it's it's yet another kind of thing that we try to bring to that military audience is saying like, you know, really really take a look at what you're sure of. You know, really examine what you're sure of, and then be open to, you know. Other interpretations. You know, I, I had a very fortunate job in the Marine Corps, and that I did human intelligence. And so, while you know, while I was in Iraq, you know, a lot of um, Marines are having language barrier issues. They're having you know, kind of confrontational issues um, with Iraqis. Where I'm seeing Iraqis who are risking their lives every day to come and talk to me and tell me, you know, this guy is killing people. This guy is killing your guys. This guy is you know doing the wrong thing. And I, I see that level of bravery and I see that, you know, that level of self-sacrifice. And so I generalize and say, you know, the Iraqis I dealt with are some of the bravest people I've ever met. And, you know, I, I bring that up and, you know, not in these seminars but in, you know, just kind of conversations with other Marines and they just kind of look at me like, what are you talking about, you know, because it's not their impression. But, you know, that that really helped me kind of understand the the big divergence that can happen within the military between, you know, I'm in the same place as you are, you know, I've got the same things happening to me that are happening to you and I have this completely diametrically opposed, you know, thing. But it also, you know, it made me go, maybe I'm wrong, you know, maybe I'm wrong about this stuff. And I think that's, you know, very helpful for that military audience to kind of be able to, you know, if they can't do it in a situation like that, at least do it through the lens of Socrates and say, you know, what am, what am I what am I more certain about and what am I less certain and maybe I should take a look at those. So we've touched on this a bit, but maybe close by so your so your courses, your seminars are for military and ex-military mm -hmm. people. Yep. And so the value of these texts in particular, so these classic texts, um, to – because most of what you're talking about is these are lessons that we can all learn and we all have – you know, we all see like just a certain side of things and peeling back the layers and seeing the other side is valuable. But what if anything in these texts is uniquely important for the military and ex-military audience to learn? And then also I'm just curious, is there – in, when they respond to the text in the seminars, is there a difference in the way that they respond to the text if they're active duty or reserve or veterans? Yeah, I mean, to, to your first point, you know, what we're really trying to get at is what is the nature of man in, in conflict and what is the nature of man in cooperation? You know, how do those two things differ? And you know, the other thing we're trying to offer is an alternative, right? So for me, it was okay. I can go to command and staff and not enjoy any of this or I can just kind of go back and hang out at St. John's or start a program like this. And, you know, while the people that need to stay in uh, need to accomplish things like that, at least I can, you know, hope to give them some some little bit of a different avenue to educate themselves that might keep them sane during the kind of less sane education that goes on within the military. And I think your last question was it, when they're responding to the texts. Mm -hmm. um, do you see a difference in the way that they interpret or respond to the texts if they're active duty versus, say, reserve or veteran? I think that the actual the biggest difference we don't see a huge difference with active duty versus veteran or even versus service. What's most entertaining and most enlightening for me is seeing the difference between uh, the more senior and more junior members that that come to the seminars. The more senior members. Uh, have read at least they think a decent amount about this and have um, many times kind of um, been within a certain worldview for a much longer time. And so they have a lot of problems with some of the bigger questions that we raise and they're, in, they're very defensive sometimes <laughs> about, about the idea of doing it. Somehow they got harangued into doing it um, or just you know the idea of asking some of these questions. And the junior folks are much more open to really examining, really critiquing, um, you know, what 
what the reading means to them and also how it impacts you know their military career. And so I mean most of the people that stick with the program are really you know company grade field grade type officers. So these are folks that are really in their like late 20s, early 30s, um, you know, haven't made that step of saying, okay, I'm going to stay in for 20 years. Um, and, you know, it just, it, it's one of those things where it's like, if you can just reach like, you know, one or two people, you know, every seminar and get them to really kind of say, wow, this is, you know, not something I knew was this important. It was not something I knew was this rich. And, you know, it's something that they're going to carry with them for the rest of their lives and go, I need to do this. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.